what does a healthy relationship look like and how do I know that I'm safe inside of a new relationship? And uh, my first response to this was, ooh, a deeply externalized locus of control. You're asking me to give you information from outside that lets you know that you're safe inside of a relationship. And that worried me. That worried me a lot. And then I thought, who the hell am I to answer this question? Because I'm not in a healthy relationship. I've been in a sequence of unhealthy relationships and friendships. So I tried to reverse engineer it so that I could give you some useful information. And I came up with five things based on what I did not enjoy in relationships and what I considered to be unhealthy. So I worked backwards from the five things that I would not ever want to see again in a relationship in the future. And it transpires that they actually gave me five principles for a moderately healthy relationship. Number one, do not instrumentalize your partner. Respect the fact that your partner is a separate human being, whether it's your partner or your friend, it's, it's the same thing. So the first rule is respect the separateness and the humanity of the other person. Respect the separateness and the humanity of the other person. Do not, and this was uh, the, came from do not, do not, the negative, instrumentalize. Do not fuse and merge with your partner. Do not expect your partner to be a source of salvation. Do not expect your partner to solve all of your problems. So it seems kind of redundant to the point of stupidity to have to say your, your partner is a person. They're a human being and they're separate to you. But so often in relationships, whether it's personal, um, a sexual relationship, an intimate relationship, a familiar relationship, even business relationships, it's like a human software fault where we sort of fuse and merge with people and we lose sight of the fact that they also are a person, separate. They have hopes and dreams and fears and desires and values that are different to ours, a whole life experience that's different to ours. They're kind of a lazy, and I've been guilty of this, a lazy placing of people into a pre-existing role. So if you're my 20th girlfriend, I might treat you like version 20 of the same person in some ways. You would go into the girlfriend-shaped hole in my life. And I might start speaking to you in an unconscious way as though you were another person, as though you were an ex-girlfriend. I've experienced that and I've been spoken to also as though I was somebody else's ex-boyfriend. Um, even went to therapy about it and it was openly admitted, yes, I confused you with my ex-boyfriend. So I was, I, a girl I was with uh, continued an argument uh, with me that she'd had with her ex-boyfriend. And I was like, I don't, I don't know the coordinates of this argument because I wasn't there <laughs> at the time you were having it. I am prepared to do some role play with you if it makes you happy, my love. But this one, I don't, you, you, haven't, you haven't instructed me on how to do this. <laughs> Pretend you're my abusive ex-boyfriend. Well, if that's what you really want. Number two, uh, to go from the negative to the positive first. So the negative was no means no. So what we don't want in a relationship is a situation where you don't respect the other person's boundaries. If somebody tells you no once, maybe twice you can push for a second no you shouldn't be pushing for a third a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh and a 20th and a 30th and a 40th no if somebody doesn't want to do what you want them to do let them be so number two expressed in the positive the second rule richie's second rule is respect people's boundaries respect their boundaries let them be whoever they want to be they could be wrong Really, objectively, they could absolutely be wrong. They could be making a terrible mistake and you could be right. But with all due respect and humility, as a human being, we are in no position to make that judgment and decision for other people. For your children, yes. For your children, yes. For another adult, no. 
I have people in my life who are hurting themselves, who are destroying themselves by their patterns of behavior. It's been a great test for me and a great learning experience for me as a recovering codependent, as a recovering people pleaser and phone responder, to be with them and to let them do it and even to watch them engage in that behavior because it provokes every single control issue in me that wants me that that makes me want to save them and engage in a sort of a savior role and i've realized fairly late in life um you just can't you have to let people be so um i'll i'll cover this very very quickly imagine you're in a relationship with somebody and you think it would be better for them if you got married and had kids and they said no i don't want that and for a thousand, well, let's say for five really good reasons, and their parents agree with you, it would be better for them. They would mature faster and, and, and grow up better if they did get married and they were in a committed relationship and they had children with you. If they said no, and you love them, and you don't hear that no, and you don't respect that no, I would question whether what you're doing is love. I would suggest it probably is more akin to the instrumentalization I mentioned earlier and the enforcing of an agenda on somebody. I have seen in my own life, not sorry, not in my life, in my personal life, in my uh, fam familial relationships and with close friends, people push each other into relationships that they didn't want to get into or push others, their partners, into a depth of relationship that that partner wasn't ready for. And it creates this um, spring effect the spring back effect where the partner is then in a state of resentment and pulling out partner one who pushes partner two to do something that they don't want to do partner one is constantly living in fear because they unconsciously feel the unconscious pull away of partner two who's living a life they don't want to live partner two will be eaten alive with resentment uh, there will be no romance left in the relationship I'm not a relationship coach or a relationship counselor. I've been to relationship counselors, but I think most relationship counselors would agree. I think this is an orthodox statement that I'm about to make. Nothing kills lust and desire and affection in a relationship faster than resentment. Most relationship counselors will tell you re resentment is a kind of um, a deeply uh, a lethal rot once it sets in. Um, and I've seen this. I've seen people pushed into situations they didn't want to be in. They resent their partner. They're leaning out. They're spending the relationship leaning out. Eventually, they'll do something. They will manifest physically what the, what's been there psychically, which is could be cheating or they'll leave or something. And uh, it would be very painful. But to the first partner, to partner one, I would always say, like, you have to respect the will of another human being. I've never in my life done that. I've never pressured anybody to do anything, ever. I am not a perfect boyfriend by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm not a perfect person. But that is such a high value for me. I would, it's upon my samurai level of honor. I would rather commit seppuku at dawn in the town square than pressure a human being to do something they didn't want to do. No means no. Whether that's physical intimacy, it's sexual, it's in the bedroom, or in the relationship, or when it comes to marriage, or it comes to children, or to living together, or to lifestyle habits, no means no. There's a line in the Bible, right? Let your no be a no and your yes be a yes. So the second rule is respect other people's boundaries. If they say no, don't keep pressuring them. Accept it. That's a separate human being. The third, this is pretty good, this. I actually didn't think I'd be good at this, but I'm listening to it, and I'm like, yeah, this, is, this seems okay. <laughs> I'm not just praising myself in video. <laughs> so to express the third principle as a negative, what I would never want to experience again in a relationship that I did experience. So these are all based on my negative experiences, and they're positives. They can be turned into positives. Your partner is not a scapegoat. Your partner is not a, a, a straw man. Your partner is not a whipping post. So to express principle number three in the positive, I would say for a healthy relationship to be healthy, you must own your own stuff. You must own your own stuff. You're not perfect. Be humble. Realize you have a shadow and that shadow is unconscious. So you have to entertain the possibility that you're doing things that are not very nice, quite unintentionally. You have to entertain the possibility. 
with reason and rationality and good philosophy. Let your mind lead here, not your heart. Be sensible, gather evidence, apply the Socratic method, apply Occam's razor. Be intelligent, but own your own stuff. Don't project your stuff onto your partner. Don't project your failings onto your partner or onto your children or onto your workmates or onto fam fa other family members. Own your own stuff. Own it. And don't turn your partner into a scapegoat. So many times I was in situations where my partner was clearly the one making a mistake. And I even warned. I can think of multiple, three or four situations where I sat down with my partner and said, listen, my love, what you're doing right now, here's a timeline. If you keep doing this, please trust me. I care about you. I love you. I want what's best for you. If you keep doing this, I know that you think the end result will be this, but the end result will not be this. It's going to be that and it's going to be negative. Please, please stop multiple times. I've, I've had this in relationships and with all off the top of my head, I know that I did that with three partners and I said that to them multiple times. I said, please, please stop. Please sit down with me. Look at me. Talk to me. Put your phone down. Turn off the TV. Look at me. Trust me. What you're doing is it's not going to work out well. And then in the end, when it didn't work out well, through some sort of mental gymnastics, through some shadow possession or, or God knows what, it became my fault. I was blamed for it. Do not project your stuff onto your partner. Do not project your shadow onto your partner. They're not a scapegoat. They're not a whipping post. And if you use them as such, you probably shouldn't be in a relationship. You must, with all due humility and mental flexibility and rationality and reason, own your own stuff. The fourth principle is equal means equal so the fourth principle is equal means equal and this is about alignment and congruence if you say you want equality in a relationship by the way i don't stri strive for equality in male female relationships it, it doesn't particularly interest me i numbers are equal equal is a principle best applied to mathematics and it typically means same it's the same. A number is equal to another number if it has the same value. People have stretched this to meaning moral value or legal value. Okay, at a legal level, yes, everybody should have equal rights. But I think the principle we should strive for isn't equal. It's fair. It's fair and bereft of abuse, bereft of exploitation. But equal means equal, and you can't cherry pick where equal is. So if you say you want equal, then you must live equal for everything at all times. You'll probably find that you don't really want equal. What you want is fair. What you want is a relationship that's bereft of exploitation. What you want is a relationship where there is a good quid pro quo, a good transaction, this for that. In the comments, people will say, that sounds cold. It sounds businesslike. Well, when you're going to live with another adult human being in socks, who's as daft and as unconscious as you are for months and then years and years and years, you'll find that thinking about things in a more legal and business-like way can save you from a lot of pain in the future. When you rush into things with your romance glasses on and you don't set the laws, you don't set the rules, you don't set the contract, even outside of marriage, you don't set the expectations properly, you will have big problems. You have to let your expectations be known and you have to be clear. Within this, if we're going to say equal means equal, both partners must be humble and they must be willing to apologize. You cannot have a partner who will brag, oh, you know me, I'll never say sorry, even if I know I'm wrong. That, that's, a, that's an adult that shouldn't be in a relationship. Until you've resolved that, that is the attitude and the stance of a defiant 14 year old in, in secondary school. It has a high school as you have in America. It has no place in an adult relationship. Equal means equal. If you expect your partner to say sorry when they're wrong, you must also say sorry when you're wrong. You must be humble. If you want equal, then you can't cherry pick when and where equal is. 
Equal must be equal everywhere. Equal for me and equal for you. You must be willing to say sorry. My recommendation that I've squeezed in on the fourth point is don't worry about equal. Worry about fair. Worry about fair. And that's for everybody to decide. That's for any adult in a relationship. You can decide what you think, what you feel is fair. And if you feel like things are not fair, speak up. Speak up. Uh, let me add that as a principle. That's really important. The fifth principle is to let that person be a person. And this pertains to growth. If you're in a relationship, a healthy relationship, that means that you're probably going to have two people who are, I like saying this to people, I like to remind them. A romance and a relationship is not a 90 minute long romantic comedy. A romance and a relationship is two adults usually living inside of the same space for years and decades. And if that comes as a shock to you, you're probably thinking about relationships in a slightly funny way. And if you think about them in a weird way, and your map of a relationship doesn't match the territory of a relationship, you'll run into trouble. As that human being that you're living with ages and has experiences, they will grow and they will change. You will grow and you will change. There's no growth without change. If we set a parameter inside of the relationship that growth and change is a threat, you're covertly denying the other person the opportunity to grow and change, and you're smothering them. So growth, change, is not to be considered a threat. The relationship must have the um, openness and scope for adaptation that allows for the other person to fully and completely express who they are across time. If you're successful and you do stay together across decades, you'll find that if somebody is really open and they are loved and they are supported and they are in a good relationship with another human being, they know they have at home, who's got really genuinely got their back and is really genuinely watching them, they will grow and change as a person. And people, human beings are quite plastic. We are very flexible, we're very adaptable and we can grow and change quite a lot if we are psychologically healthy and we should. Let that person be a person, let them grow and let them change. The sixth one, which I just remembered, and this is based on my experiences that I had um, in uh, this year that we're now leaving, thank God. Goodbye 2022, um, is uh, to speak up. A healthy relationship is a relationship in which you can speak up and in which you can be safely heard if there's a problem. So negative feedback, let's, let's, say, let's say it like this. The rule for number six is, is negative feedback is not to be taken as a cause for argument. You must see if this was a business or, or you were training somebody to, to for, see, all I can do is show you the areas of my life that do work, that I do have some experience in, or you're training somebody to do something that's sportive or combative, or I imagine it's the same for military training. You need to know where things are going wrong because they will. What's the military phrase by Klaus von something Witz? No plan survives contact with the enemy. So you have a plan. You have a fantasy when you enter into your relationship. You have your romance glasses on. No plan survives contact with the enemy. Who's the enemy? Is it your partner? Nope. It's reality, reality. Your plan is not going to survive contact with the enemy called reality. That's fine. So you have to be willing to let it go. That means you need to know where things are going wrong. Like if you're training somebody to fight, or uh, like was the last time I trained, the last person I trained to fight was a girl and I was teaching her boxing specifically, not Muay Thai, not wrestling, boxing. And there were things she did very, very well, but her defense sucked. Should I go and let her fight? and not tell her that the defense sucks, she's gonna get knocked out. Like, that's not good. Did she like hearing that her defenses suck? No, she did not enjoy that negative feedback at all. It wasn't pleasant. It doesn't stroke the ego. She's used to hearing how amazing she is and what a natural she is, but her defenses and her reactions sucked. So I told her, it doesn't feel good. Not everything inside of a relationship should feel good. That's not a reasonable expectation. You're not doing everything perfectly. Your relationship isn't going perfectly. So you have to have an environment where negative feedback can be heard without 
one or both parties becoming defensive and it turning into a heated argument and it getting personal. So the principle is you have to create an environment where you can say where things are going wrong. And then if I can add like another level to this principle and be greedy and shove two things into one principle, you must speak up. So the environment needs to be set by both people that you can talk and say where things are going wrong. And you must, must, must say when you're not happy. Don't be proud. There was a, an experience I had with somebody who was being proud and they didn't want to say when I'd hurt them. I knew I'd hurt them, but I had to retroactively figure it out. And I knew I'd hurt them because they were doing and saying things that only a hurt person would do and say. And I went back through our conversations and I went back through different actions and different events. And I was like, something has gone wrong here. And I think in that case, um, an expectation wasn't set truthfully. She hadn't really told me what she wanted. She just told me what she thought I wanted to hear. And then when I acted in accordance with the agreement, she was then hurt. She, she made two mistakes. She didn't further back where in number four, where we said you have to, you have to set your expectations clearly. She didn't set her expectations clearly. She didn't tell me the truth. She wasn't humble enough to tell me the truth of what she actually really wanted because she was trying to pressure me into doing something that had she told me what she wanted, I wouldn't have done. So she's being dishonest and then it hurt her and she wouldn't say. And her pride, she thought the right way to deal with it was to push me away and to punish me by being cold and indifferent and maybe... I don't know what her long-term plan was. Maybe she hoped I would figure it out or I'd work it out, but I didn't. I just terminated the relationship. I just dissolved it because I asked her four or five times, you need to tell me what's wrong. You need to, you need to tell me why, that you're hurt if you're hurting and you need to tell me what your real expectations are. Nope, there's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong. Of course, it's easier to say that. Of course, you might feel like you're being um, powerful or a boss or whatever when you say these things it's like slay queen slay and guess what now you're single because the guy you were with could see what you're doing and he wasn't interested in it be humble you have to be able to say to the other person when you did this it hurt me and even to be able to change the paradigms of the relationship and say like i listen i told you that i was okay with you doing this it turns out i'm not i need you to know that so you either got to stop doing it or we got to terminate this relationship. And had she done that, I would have apologized and I would have stopped doing it because it wasn't that important to me. But she didn't. She refused to do it. So you have to speak up. One party, the other party, we need to have an agreement. You can speak up. You can give me negative feedback. I hurt you. I messed up. I didn't think it was hurting you, but it was. Then I, or the other party, partner number two, has to sit and listen. You might be wrong. You might, the other person might be, I don't know, maybe they misheard something or they're, they're misinterpreting something or they simply told you that they were okay with it. Is it going to help me to, to throw that back in her face and to mock her and to be angry with her or to be cruel with her when she's hurting? Is it going to help me to do that? Is it going to help the relationship? No. I think that she acted the way she did, though, because somebody else had already done that to her. That wound was already there. So you have to speak up. And if your partner wants to speak up, you have to sit and listen to them. Even if you disagree with what, with what they're saying, you have to sit and listen and be OK with it and not get freaked out and not get triggered into an emotional flashback just because you're hearing some negative feedback.